Well, the article came out of the um, the 1619 project that the New York Times put together, right? Where they're uh, looking to uh, see the origins of things a lot of people take for granted today uh, in slavery or, in my case, segregation, which is a, a way station between slavery uh, and the present. And so they called a bunch of us together. Um, uh, I mean, we were supposed to meet at the New York Times, but a lot of us, like I, came in through Skype. And had a conversation, just kind of kicking around ideas about things that um, that you could trace back like that. And uh, in my first book, White Flight, uh, I'd written about uh, segregation in Atlanta. And one of the things I'd uh, I chronicled there was this issue of uh, segregation and its impact on the highways around Atlanta. You know, you know they're they're awful. Uh, and uh, and and I was really struck by the fact that some of these things I was trying to navigate. And this is back in the late 90s, trying to navigate at the time, driving I-20 or, you know, uh, uh, taking uh, uh, the highway up to, up to Gwinnett was, uh, was, was really difficult. Uh, and I was, I was kind of surprised to find this thing I was studying in the 50s and 60s explain this thing I was in the 90s. So it seemed to me to be a, a good option for something we could explore. And they were really excited about it. So uh, uh, they went through and, you know, kind of divided up all these different things we brainstormed about. And that was the one they uh, they said, you know, hey, you mentioned that. Would you like to write on it? And I was, I was thrilled to do it. Sure, right. There, there are two ways in which uh, highways and local expressways, even, even major streets, really come into play here. One is uh, we have to remember that uh, the rise of the modern expressway movement, the interstate highways in the 50s, is really obviously a post-war transformation and that hit American cities at the same time a lot of them are wrestling with issues of segregation, especially in the South, right? So um, uh, there are two ways in which it really, uh, uh, these two things that seem to be separate, highways and segregation, really came together. One was as these roads are being placed, uh, it, there are a variety of people who determine where they go. I won't bore you with that. But basically, local people have a say in this. Local officials have a say in where these roads get placed. And it shouldn't be a surprise that as they're thinking about where they're going to drop highways and destroy neighborhoods, they invariably single out what they see as the worst neighborhoods uh, in their communities. And these are overwhelmingly poor communities. And in most places, these are overwhelmingly African-American or in some places, Latino uh, neighborhoods that they single out for demolition. These are slum areas. The highways are a way to get rid of those. So you, you're going to destroy some existing area. Why not destroy the worst, right? Uh, so that's part of it. So a lot of these roads are uh, uh, routed through what had been uh, old standing black neighborhoods, not just in Atlanta, but across the country, north and south, east and west. Uh, and they destroy a lot of those, a lot of those areas. Uh, this dovetails with the process of urban renewal, which did the same thing, targeted downtown uh, uh, slum areas, as they were known, uh, and really uh, obliterated black neighborhoods. So uh, the saying goes, popularized uh, by the poet James Baldwin, uh, the, the novelist James Baldwin, that um, urban renewal really means Negro removal, right? So that's one way. These roads are literally used to destroy uh, black neighborhoods. In other places, though, the roads are used to divide white and black neighborhoods. And so this is something that happens in Atlanta, uh, in Interstate 20 on the west, west side. And they're very explicit about this. This isn't guesswork uh, that I had to do. This is in uh, Mayor, Bill Hall, Mayor, excuse me, Mayor Bill Hartsfield's letters. He writes the head construction uh, in the city, head of construction in Atlanta, and says, I want you to go out and mark this road now and mark it here so we can show whites in this part of town that the black neighborhoods on this other side of this line, will there'll be a highway between them. That's going to defend them and keep these neighborhoods at part and in their eyes at peace. Right? So it was both about destroying black neighborhoods, but also kind of walling off black neighborhoods. And with that logic in mind, uh, is how you get the kind of the contorted and um, and weird ways in which the highways in Atlanta and other cities take place. It only really makes sense if you're thinking about well, just from a pure traffic facilitation standpoint, we would put them this way. But that's not the primary goal. The primary goal to do that, but also to defend or destroy these neighborhoods. Yeah, again, so the, the, the here's an instance where, again, the transportation innovation coincided with uh, a new stage in the civil rights uh, struggle uh, uh, across the country. And so when Martyr really pops up in Atlanta, it's in uh, the mid 60s to early 70s at the peak moment of white flight out of Atlanta. And so uh, in the book, I chronicle all these whites who had been perfectly happy inside Atlanta, but but move out to the lily white suburbs on the north side. Uh, and we have to remember, this is a period in which these suburbs are overwhelmingly white. 
95, 96% white. That section of North Fulton County outside the city is 99% white, right? These are overwhelmingly white refuges. And they flee to these areas um, to leave the city behind. And they see MARTA as those problems from the city creeping back out to get them, right? That they had purposely left the city behind and they don't want anything to do with the city. And so they want to move out. And it's not just that they see, and these are statements that are often said in print and in private, not just that they, they feel that this is going to bring African-Americans from the city out to the suburbs and therefore, in their mind, crime and all sorts of other problems they associate with the central city. But they worried that being linked to the center of Atlanta through metropolitan transit would mean that they'd be linked to Atlanta through other metropolitan solutions. And in this period, that means school desegregation. It means busing, right? So they're worried that if they link up on the subways or the interstates or bus plans or whatever is going to link the city and the suburbs in a metropolitan transportation solution, it's going to also mean they're going to be involved in school integration too, right? So they just draw the line at this and they don't want it at all. And so these counties overwhelmingly reject a uh, Cobb uh, and Gwinnett overwhelmingly reject MARTA when it comes up for votes uh, in the 60s and early 70s and are still resistant, of course, to it today. The thing that comes up time and time again is just expand MARTA. For the, and it's all it's clearly people inside the city. Just please expand MARTA. But the folks in the suburbs don't want that, right? Uh, there were some more imaginative solutions that were in the original draft of the, of the, of the, of the essay that got cut. Uh, uh, underground tunnels throughout the city. Uh, one guy had jokingly, I think jokingly, wrote in that he wanted a series of zip lines along the skyscrapers uh, that people could commute to and from work that way, and therefore they would miss the traffic. I'm hoping that was a joke. Uh, but but the only serious ones really were MARTA, MARTA, MARTA. And it's what makes sense, but there's still this resistance uh, in the suburbs to it. Not as strong as it was, but as you saw in that vote earlier this year in Gwinnett, uh, still uh, a majority opposed.